that's what you do. Okay, I've just made you host. So admitting people will probably be on. Right. Thank you. Oh, over to you, sir. Yeah, I'm trying to connect to my laptop so I can display the stuff. Okay, yeah, I'm trying to connect with my laptop so I can share my screen. Because the slide I'm using is on my screen, on my laptop, I mean. Sorry, I'm still on. I'm having difficulty connecting with my laptop. So once I'm connected, I'll just show my screen. Okay, I'm coming. I think I should just leave from my own phone so I can use my laptop to connect directly. I'm sorry for the delay.
Yeah, thank you. I was already picking around that option of updating to my Google Drive and then working from there. Okay, so I'll just share my screen now and then we'll start. So this I can see online, I can see, of course, Mr. Taiwo and then Larry. So sorry for the delay. If you can hear me, can you just give a signal? Maybe you raise your hand or you can hear you. We can hear you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I need to be able to share my screen. I can share my screen right now. Could you please enable screen sharing? I still can't share my screen. Michael. Sorry, I'm coming, I'm coming. Michael, just make him post. You can share your screen now. Okay, yeah. So I guess we can just do the normal screen. Okay, so uh, thank you for the honor or the privilege of taking this tutorial. It's fun actually. Now, the math, the math course is quite interesting because there are things that we can relate with. But the problem is close to the end where we have the calculation part. I guess there are things that uh, we did not have an idea of or that we couldn't practice because of the uh, Unprecedented circumstances that we found ourselves in. So I'll just go straight to the course, starting from the beginning. These are things that we can easily relate with. And I would first say that my own side of teaching is not basically the exam oriented one, but the understanding oriented one. So if you listen properly, you will have an idea of what exactly the concept is. And so long as you understand it, I guess facing the exam will be a lot easier. So I focus more on explanations and logical uh, reasoning of the concept and trying to picture what exactly is being said in the context. So the math topics, I think they are about, yeah, just one, two, three, four, and five topics in the entire course. Then we have the occurrence and then the distribution of water and nature, then hydrology and fundamentals of flow in force media, then flow in aquifers. Okay, I think there are just four. And then flow in the air system. These two are the ones that are calculations. Other ones are familiar things that we know. So from the beginning, first is we have to understand that the man definitely will tell us to explain some things that we should expect already. And that is the definition of groundwater hydrology. Now, this definition is definition of two things combined into one, which is definition of groundwater first, and then definition of hydrology. So if you can define what hydrology is, hydrology definitely is the science or the branch of science that studies the occurrence, distribution, movement, and the storage of water on earth or in nature. Then link it to groundwater. Groundwater is water that has gone into the ground and then it's existing between natural geologic formation, even artificial geologic formation that eventually becomes saturated. So the definition is hydrology is the is the that deals with the occurrence and then distribution and movements of water 
and probably you add storage of water as well because it's so there is a porous. And then the water itself would have infiltrated into the ground uh, through the process of infiltration, and then it occurs beneath the water table. Now, the fact that we have to mention occurring with, occurrence with, uh, below the water table is that the water itself, once it is still above the water table, then it is still close to surface water. So once it goes below the water table, they can call it the underground water. So groundwater is the water that eventually gets below the water table because the water table is the highest point of the water below the earth. So the top of the water or the top of the surface of the water below the earth is what you call the water table. So it goes below, below the water table and then whatever formation that contains them becomes saturated with them. Now, one question that you will ask us is to tell him the importance of this groundwater hydrology or link it to the hydrological cycle. Now, linking it to the hydrological cycle will require you to talk about groundwater in terms of how it relates to the water cycle itself. And then you have to be mentioning the full surface and then the method of storage. Here we talked about the occurrence of groundwater. Talking about the occurrence of groundwater, you have to talk about the fact that it occurs in nature as due to the process of precipitation. And then it also occurs due to the process of melting glaciers and then other activities that lead to the formation of uh, water. Now, these waters, they pass into the earth by the process of infiltration. So that is the link between all other forms of water or all other forms of formation of water and then the groundwater. So if you do not mention infiltration, then your explanation or description or definition might eventually get some sort of distorted. And then the distribution, they are distributed all over the places, either in a large area extent or within a small confinement. And then you also have to mention their storage. That's why I said this definition should involve their storage. Their storage is where you talk about the aquifers and then the aquifers. Now, this storage can occur in many different forms, but usually they occur together. We'll get to where we talk about the aquifers, where we talk about the aquifers, the aquifuge, and then the aquifuge. They are all the same, uh, the same kind of formation, but just that the one that we focus on is the aquifer because the aquifer is the one that contains the water and they can also give out the water. Aquifuge and aquifuge, they occur almost in the same kind of scenarios. You can find them almost together, but one of them is our focus because that is the one that contains the water and that can also give out the water. And also you have to mention the movement of the water. The movement of the water, you are talking about the fact that underground water is not stable. I mean, it is not static. It moves from place to places over a period of years. And then linking it to the hydrological cycle again, you have to talk about the fact that when this water moves, it gets to the point where it returns to the surface. So the water returning to the surface in forms of springs or even where the water table hits the ground surface and then the water springs out into maybe a water body or something. So you are talking about the occurrence, the distribution of the processes, the movement and also the storage of groundwater hydrology. Now, groundwater itself is recharged by a process where, uh, the process called groundwater recharge is the process where surface water gets infiltrated into the ground to complement the amount of water that, are, or that is already present in the ground. And this groundwater recharge can be of two different forms. That is the natural recharge and then the artificial recharge. If the recharge occurs naturally, that means probably due to the process of rainfall or the infiltration generally, that's where you call it the natural recharge. And there you are talking about precipitation water flowing over streams and surfaces, and even water that is just logged on the surface of the earth or on the surface of the ground, going into the ground itself. Those ones are normal things that happen by nature. Why the artificial one, those are the ones that were prompted by probably human, should I say human, structures, structures are created by humans or human activities. Human structures in the sense that they are talking about reservoirs and canals that were created by human beings. So whatever kind of thing comes out of that, that leads to water going into the ground is what you call the artificial recharge. But when you talk about activities, they are talking about irrigation. So for example, if human beings can intentionally pour water over a place just to 
artificially recharge the water inside the ground. It happens. Or even through diversions. Probably you want to create a dam somewhere and then you want to they add to divert the water to, to another part. The diversion of the water to a different part will lead to what you call a groundwater recharge wherever they have diverted it. So if these questions come and then you ask a lot of these things, just try to imagine them yourselves, what they mean, and then from there, you'll be able to express whatever you want to express. So here, this is a diagram that is groundwater in hydrological cycle. This diagram, the man will definitely tell us, or most likely will tell us to produce what he actually emphasized this diagram. And the diagram itself is, the, name, the title of the diagram is the groundwater in hydrologic cycle. Now, the water bearing formations of the earth act as conduits for transmission and reservoir for groundwater storage. Now, what do they mean by the word conduit? This conduit, conduit is more like a path or a link for something to flow. So they act as conduit because they have interconnected four spaces. I don't know, let me see if I can create some things that you can see. Okay, let's assume you have the groundwater this way. And then you have particles all around. The fact that these things are interconnected, it makes the water to pass through. So water can actually pass through all of these regions. So that means this path where it is going through is more like the conduit. They can view it as a path where the water can go through. So it acts as a conduit and then that as a reservoir because the water in this place, before it leaves this region, it could actually be tapped. The way, or should I say, the pace or the speed at which the water will move from this or through these interstices or through the pores or through the conduit is not at a very fast pace. Sometimes it might take years for them to move from kilometers to kilometers. So that means at a point in time or at any particular region, the water could be tapped. The water is resident at a particular point. That's why the fact that it's moving. They don't move as fast as surface water. So the fact that they don't move as fast as surface water, that means they actually reserved in a particular place at a particular time. So they are more like a, the water bearing formations, those are the things that are as the conduit. So you can tap them at any time because they hold the water at a particular point in time. And the fact that the pores are linked is why we can call them conduit. So that is why I gave this explanation here that they act as conduit. Why, right? Okay, yeah. They act as conduit because they have interconnected four spaces. Now for this diagram, for you to picture how best to draw this diagram, I think it's better if you imagine it this way. For this diagram to be drawn, I, I would suggest that first you understand that the diagram itself is talking about nature. So if you can picture or imagine what the diagram is talking about, you won't forget any components of this. Now, first the diagram has the atmosphere, followed by the ground surface, followed by the piezometric surface, and then the aquifer. Now, I don't know why they called this the piezometric surface. Probably because they imagined that this is a confined aquifer. Piezometric surface is only related to confined aquifer. They could have actually called it water table, but they called it piezometric surface. So for me to draw this, the way I imagine that I would draw it is to understand that there are actually four regions or four layers. So this is layer one, and then here is layer number two, and then here layer three, and then layer four. So I would first draw four circles for different layers. So that one we act as the ground surface. Then I will draw the aquifer. And that is what I would here. That there are three layers and then eight parameters. Is it three layers? I meant four layers, I guess. Four layers and eight parameters. So here, since there are four layers, I'll just link them. Now that they are linked, first, we have to understand that there is the atmosphere. So you have to label the layers next. 
and to put a plain surface around this region. Right, let's just leave it like that. Let's just draw it this way. Let's draw it this way. Now the next thing is to label the layers. This is the soil surface, the atmosphere, and then the piezometric surface, and then the aquifer. Now, for the processes, for the soil surface, we know that definitely there should be precipitation. So you can just draw some cloud formations here, and then signal that with the precipitation. And since there is precipitation, then definitely the water should return back to the atmosphere. So you can call this a P. As well as what is called so we can call here, okay. So while we are waiting for the screen, here is the precipitation. Now, for the water to return back to the atmosphere, we need the evapotranspiration. transpiration, both of them together, evapotranspiration. transpiration. That's the So you can just signal that with any kind of line. Now, there is something that the man explained to us in class, which is the potential, I mean, the yeah, potential evaporate, evaporate trans, uh, potential, so effective precipitation, yeah. Effective precipitation, that is the uh, proper, or should I say, the net amount of water that gets into or that gets to the surface of the earth without being interrupted along the way. Now, when the precipitation is coming, a lot of things are going to happen, such that not all of the water that got precipitated from the clouds will get to the earth. For example, some of them are going to be intercepted by vegetation cover. Some of them are going to be intercepted by let's say, dust particles. And some of them are also going to evaporate while coming along the way. So the water that comes from the atmosphere, not all of it will get to the ground. So the one that comes, or the ones that get to the ground are the ones that we refer to as evapotranspiration, and that is the number third parameter in this. It's called effective precipitation, I mean, and that's the number three parameter in this particular diagram. Now, the fourth parameter you are talking about the, uh, what's the name now? The surface runoff. That is on the surface runoff QS, and you can see the direction along the surface. So you could just indicate that one as well as surface runoff. Well, I'll do it this way QS as surface runoff. And then here, this is the surface discharge that is measured at the uh, the spot the man called it at the station. Yeah, total discharge at the station. So after that, this right here we have five parameters already. So we have three more to go. Then you have the infiltration. Now the water that comes from the surface into the ground gives us the infiltration and not all of the water that gets from the surface will also get the piezometric surface. So all of the water coming from the surface can call them infiltration altogether. But the one that eventually gets to this piezometric surface is what you call the effective infiltration, PI. Because some of these are going to stop along the way. Some of them are going to be soaked up by the uh, by the soil samples or the substances that make up the ground itself. So since some of them are also going to be trapped in the pore spaces, not all of it. So if you measure the amount of water getting to the ground surface, and then the amount of water getting to the piezometric surface, there will be a little difference. And then this effective precipitation is the adequate amount of water or the exact amount of water that gets to the piezometric surface. So we know that the piezometric surface is the water table, but in relation to the confined aquifer. 
I don't deny we'll see a proper definition for that. Now, then to the aquifer, now we have how many parameters? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then the final one is the groundwater discharge, QW. Now, you should not forget some things about this particular diagram. We said that there are four layers and then eight parameters. Now, the eight parameters, first we have the effective, we have the evapotranspiration, we have the precipitation, we have the effective precipitation, that's the amount of water that gets to the ground surface from the precipitated water. Then we have the surface or not for surface flow. Then we have the surface discharge and then the effective infiltration. I already talked about that. And the infiltration itself and now the groundwater discharge. Now, these arrows that this man mentioned here, or that this man put here, that is the arrow for aquifer. The man told us, he said many times, that the groundwater itself has a direction of flow that is determined by the slope of the aquifer. So this direction put here is determined by the slope of the aquifer. And this direction itself will also determine the direction of flow of this infiltrated water. So each of these water coming down from the ground surface to the, to the piezometric surface, they will have to follow the direction of this, the way it is going. So that is all about the diagram. Now, labeling the particular space or the particular layers that we have. First, you have the atmosphere. You have to label this person as the atmosphere, this region as the atmosphere. Then we have the ground surface. And then we have the piezometric surface. And the aquifer. So if you imagine it this way, I think it's easy for you to just draw this diagram without any disturbance. First, draw four circles, label each of the circles, then draw something like a plane to signify the ground surface, and then put some sort of ground formations on it, maybe some rocks or plants or anything. And then for the piezometric surface, just give the direction to follow the direction of the aquifer. That's all. And then you start putting in about eight parameters. When you count your parameters and they are not up to eight, just know that something is missing. You have about four, about three types of runoff or discharge. First is the groundwater discharge and then ground runoff, the second, and then the underground or the yeah, underground runoff. Yeah, at the surface discharge and the surface runoff, and then the underground runoff. And the processes that are involved, there are about five of them effective precipitation, the precipitation itself, then evapotranspiration, and infiltration, and then effective infiltration. Those are the parameters that are involved. Now, there is also this that the man always talks about, which is the budget equation or the hydrological budget, the budget equation for the geological basin. Here it is talking about the fact that effective precipitation is the amount of precipitation that gets to the ground less, or the total amount of precipitation less the evapotranspiration, which means that not all of the water coming from the surface will eventually get to the ground. Some of them will be returned back. Some of them are going to be intercepted by the surface cover of the shellacic vegetation. So when you have a value for precipitation, just subtract the evapotranspiration from it, and then you have the effective precipitation. Now, due to the storage capacity, groundwater reservoirs with small flow rates provide extensively distributed sources of water supply. I said it before, that they have the ability to retain water for a while because they have small flow rates. That's important for us to know. They have a very small flow rate. That means for a particular time, you can trap them or they remain somehow static to uh, per se at a particular point so you can get them. Now, groundwater, imagine the surface streams and channels aid in sustaining stream flow when surface runoff is low or non existent. Now, what this is telling us is that groundwater itself can, should I say, sustain stream flow in the sense that. Groundwater can get to become stream flow when the water table hits the surface of the ground. 
So water inside the ground gets to flow into the stream and then the stream itself is recharged. And this is one of the things that you're supposed to describe in the definition or the description of groundwater hydrology, where you link it to the total or the global hydrologic spectrum. In the sense that the groundwater sustains the surface water and the surface water sustains groundwater. The way surface water sustains groundwater is by infiltration to recharge it. And then the groundwater will sustain surface water when the spring heats or meets with the surface of the ground and then it recharges, it recharges the surface water. Now, water pump from wells may represent, may represent in some regions of the well, that's normal. Replenishment of groundwater is a function of these factors. Now, what this is saying is that groundwater recharge depends on these factors. Factors that affect groundwater recharge. First is geomorphology. Geomorphology, I explained it here, that it is the study of landforms and landform evolution. So this was just talking about the topography. That's the single word for it, topography. Let's put an indication here. Or better, you can just say the surface relief. That means that the way the surface is is formed or the composition of the surface itself determines how fast or how well the groundwater is recharged. Then number two is the, the subsurface geology. That means after going from the surface, then what is the composition or what's the form of the things under the ground? And they are talking about lithology. Lithology itself is the composition or the type of rocks that you have inside the ground, such as sandstone or limestone. So what are the rocks made of? If the surface of the ground is steepy, that means it is not gentle, then the groundwater recharge may not be as fast or as quick, or the rate may not be as high as when it is, uh, it is gentle. But then, even if it is gentle, then the composition of the rocks, which is what you call the lithology, or the subsurface geology, will also determine how fast the water will drain into the ground. And then we also have the soil surface. What is the form of the soil surface? Here we have the vegetation cover. I think from Shudamadi's class, we will understand how vegetation cover affects the groundwater recharge. And then depth to piezometric surface. Now for this one, here we understand that the piezometric surface is here. So if, let's get rid of this. The piezometric surface, if the, pie, if the piezometric surface is closer to the top, then it might get somehow saturated too soon, such that the groundwater recharge may eventually be halted at a particular point. But if this piezometric surface is far, then the recharge, I think the recharge will eventually be slow. So if it is close to the top, that means the piezometric surface is close to the, um, to the ground surface, then you have a faster recharge that when it is far from the ground surface. If there is a well close by this place, let's assume that there is a well around here. Now, if the water from this well eventually gets dried up, because the piezometric surface is closer to the ground surface, then whatever amount of water is draining from here into the ground will eventually reach here, let's say, in a few amounts of, in a few period of time. But if the piezometric surface is far, let's assume that this is where the piezometric surface is, rather than here, then it will take even longer for the water to move from this part for the water to move from the surface down to here, if this were to be the piezometric surface. That means that the closer the piezometric surface to the surface of the ground, the higher the ground recharge rate. I believe that is clear. If eventually we get asked, just explain this in your own terms with the full understanding that you have. Now, management of water resources. Here we are talking about the artificial part of the groundwater recharge. Other ones that we have talked about are the natural part, not the artificial part. Groundwater recharge can be affected by human activities, such as water management processes. And they are talking about the dam. Human beings can create dams by themselves to recharge the ground, or can even release the water in the dam for, uh, for the purpose of irrigation or a groundwater nourishment in any particular environment, and also channelization and then conservation. And then even flooding can eventually and recharge the ground or flood management processes. Now, types of groundwater flow. 
when we are saying diagrams, and the diagrams here are also easy to draw, just understand how they are formed first, and then it's easier for each to learn. This one, they call them types of groundwater flows. I don't know how that name really applies to what we have here. Now, first one is the depression spring. This one is formed when you have the ground surface meeting the water table. What does that mean? That means that here you have the ground itself at the top, and then the water table following a particular line. Here we have the water table. If the ground eventually bends or there is a slope anywhere to the point where the slope goes so deep that it meets the water table, what you have is what you call what you call a depression spring. So by any way, just draw your own. Me, when I first drew mine, I had it somewhere like this. Let's assume that this is the ground, then just draw your own water table to meet anywhere. Then you can clean anywhere here and then make it deep this way. So this part forms your depression spring, whichever way you have it. Or better still, you can even do something like this and then assume the water table, if poorly goes this way, let's assume it's a water table. If this place has an hole somewhere here, let's assume there is a depression place somewhere. So let's do this. Then the water table comes to look like this. Then you have here to do your depression spring. So whichever way you want to explain that, that one is easy to, to say. So the depression spring is formed when the water table meets the ground surface. That's easy. And then number two, you have the contact spring. Contact spring, this happens when a permeable water bearing formation, don't forget the word permeable, overlying the less permeable surface intersects the ground surface. A permeable water bearing formation overlying a less permeable water formation intersects the ground surface. What does that mean? That means you have a less permeable or an impervious surface on the ground. One part is impervious, and then you have the previous one. Let's assume that we have the previous. And then you have the previous as well. At the point where this thing meets the ground surface here, you know why this is intersecting each other. At this point, you have a kind of spring that's formed because this impervious surface will definitely contain some water because water cannot get to the impervious one, so the water is retained in this region of the ground. And since the water is retained in this, in this region of the ground, this water surface eventually heats. Or this uh, water table eventually makes the surface of the ground, and then you have the special spring. So just draw it in any way that you can and ensure that you have one layer at the top that you label the previous, and then the previous layer at the bottom, and then have the water table working in between them to intersect the ground surface. And then the next one is the factor article. This one is equally easy. And this one is formed when you have impervious surfaces binding or bounding an impervious surface and then the water in between it is actually very much under pressure so here you have an impervious surface around here this one's impervious then they are trapping the impervious surface under high pressure so this impervious surface that they are trapped under high pressure now one thing then happens they call it a fracture fracture as it are. now the fracture is when a part of this impervious surface gets broken. Let's assume that there's a crack here. So the water forces itself out. Here, it's not like it is meeting the surface. The impervious surface of water table is not meeting the ground surface at all. As compared to this, where you have water table meeting the ground surface, and then here to water table meeting the ground surface. Here, nothing is meeting the ground surface. There is a force on the impervious layer where the water forces itself out. So you can just draw one layer on the ground. Then another layer of impervious surface. Then here is fabulous. Here is where you have the water pressure. And then there is a crack anywhere here. This water itself will force itself out because the water is confined under pressure. So I believe that is equal.
polyfluid. Okay, so next is the impervious rock stone. Of course, the tubular channels for fractures of impervious rock. This one too, uh, it occurs in fractures of impervious rock. But here, it is not like it is confined under pressure. That's different. And then the last one is tubular fracture, uh, tubular fracture stone. I don't know what the difference between these two is, but this one looks more like what we have in that definition down there. So when it comes when it comes to asking about the types of groundwater flow, we have the depression spring, the contact spring, the fracture at and then the impervious rock spring. Now, if you can have an image of these diagrams in your head, understanding the way they are formed. Helps you to remember the names of it. But even if it is the name that you remember, then drawing this will not be a problem. Now, this chart area, this is the portion of the drainage basin in which the net saturated flow of groundwater is directed away from the water table. What they mean here is the point where the net saturated flow of the groundwater is directed away from the water table is what you call the discharge area. Let's assume you have the water table, or let's say formation here, and then the water table is anywhere here. Where this flow of water is away from here, let's assume it is flowing outside or even to a spring. Here can be a discharge area for this. Here can also be a discharge area for this. And then here can also be a discharge area for that. So the portion of this drainage basin in which the net saturated flow is directed away from the water table is what you call the discharge area. So in your own words, you can describe it anyhow, but better still is the man's definition. For me, I don't know how to help it. So I try to understand what exactly it means so that I can write it into my own way. So the portion of the drainage basin in which the net saturated flow of the groundwater is directed away from the water table is what we call the discharge flow. I believe you guys are following. Are you following? Are you say something? I'm for we're following, we're following. Is that a wali? No, it's me now. Larry, have you voice? Yeah. Wow, okay. Wali is here, wali is here, wali is here. We are we do follow you. We do follow you, we follow you. I don't hear. We do follow that movement. We do follow tapping king too. I hear you. Now, for the groundwater movement, there's nothing that you need to know about that. Just understand that the way water moves in the ground was studied by Darcy. And then this is Darcy's equation. And Darcy is talking about the velocity itself. And we also know that from the, I think, equation of continuity, that Q or equation of discharge, let me this. Q equals to AB. And if the V was said by that to be Ki, then definitely Q equal to Kia. According to that, that's what this is talking about. So there's really nothing to come in this way. There's no way they can have the question here that we need to know it. Now, the only parameter you have, you have to define here is the I. And that's the fact that the I is what they call the hydraulic region. The man always said it that whenever we're writing the formula that we should try to write out the definition of whatever we are saying and then if there is any sub formula which as well put it there. So the I is the hydraulic gradient, which is the change in vertical distance over change in horizontal distance, or change in height over change in uh, the distance itself. And that is what we have here. Now there's something that we need to understand in this case which also almost got me confused. And that's the fact that there can be two types of views. First, we have the VA and then the normal V itself. Now, the VA is what you call the Darcy velocity or the discharge velocity. That's just normal velocity. That's the normal V. But based on the fact that when the water is flowing in this region, let's assume that water comes here to this surface A. That's the area. And then the area through which the water will flow when particles are present would definitely not be the same as the A because the particles themselves will occupy a huge amount of space. 
So this water that is flowing in this region will only pass through some small spaces, which means that it's not passing through the entire area that you have here. Now, these spaces where it is passing through, it will have a velocity that is called the interstitial velocity. That's what you have here, interstitial velocity or the seepage velocity. That means the velocity through which it is passing through all of these spaces. And then that velocity itself is determined by the porosity. That means what is the amount of space that it's passing through. So the normal velocity that you have that is coming with this velocity through which it's coming here, divided by the porosity will give you the velocity through which it is passing inside here. That, that's the case. So give that clear. Now, if you read through here, you will see that the first velocity that we have, which is an apparent velocity, representing the velocity at which water should move through an aquifer if it were an open channel. That means that if it were not encountering any, if it does not encounter any kind of uh, obstruction from any particle or any kind of soil formation, that is the velocity at which it is supposed to flow. But when it starts having an encounter with any kind of particle, that means it has to force itself to force spaces. That's when you have what is called the seepage velocity. That means it is seeping through. And this seepage velocity obviously should, I don't know if it should, if it should be less, because according to this, it is actually more than the normal velocity. That means that the velocity at which water will flow through the surface is actually less than the velocity through which it will force itself to a pore space. Now, however, the cross sectional area of flow to a pore medium is actually much smaller than the dimension of flow passage because the flow is actually limited to the pore spaces only. That's what I said here. Now, the only way you need to remember, or the only thing I need to remember in that regard, is that the normal velocity divided by the porosity will give you the six page velocity. That's what you should remember. And then when you start putting in the velocity, the formula for velocity, you find out that according to that, you have velocity to the ki, then divided by n, you have the six page velocity. That's it. And the example that the man gave is that if porosity is 33, then this is 3v. What that means is that if we have porosity to 33%, we know that our VA should be normal V divided by 30 to the last part of the By the time you divide that, and then you turn it to and you have three to be left. That's all. Now, the range of, of validity of that is low. Uh, this one does not have any much problem as well. What they are talking about is that that is low depends or it's not always valid. And it is only valid for laminar flow. And if Reynolds number is applicable to laminar flow for a range of about one accurately, and then when it approaches, then it is already deviated. That means that that is is also applicable. And that is is applicable to laminar flow, and the Reynolds number is also applicable to laminar flow. That means that that is law and laminar flow have something in common. And then the range for of Reynolds number for laminar flow is around less than one. When it is going to get around one, it starts having some deviation. That means that the limit for that is flow is also less than one for it to be accurately valid. But when it starts going beyond one, then the value starts deviating. That's the definition, or that's the explanation of everything that is written here. But when it gets to 10, then the deviation is becoming more not negligible, it's becoming more apparent. So the value of Reynolds number of 10 is the limit for the application of value to law of uh, that is equation or that is law. The that is law would apply more when it is less than one, but when it gets up to 10, it will start departing, which means that the 10 is the limit for application of that is law. When when the Reynolds number is over 10, then that is law seems to be applicable. Now we need the occurrence of Granddaughter to global hydrology concept. I already said that before that I have to talk about the definition of the granddaughter cell, granddaughter geology, talk about the way it is formed, talk about its movement, and then talk about how it depends on other uh, kind of hydrological cell components, and then the processes that involved, and how granddaughter itself is stored. And then you'll be talking about 
they are preferred, they are preferred and gone. And then that's where we are doing this. Now, occurrence of groundwater. Groundwater occurs in many geologic formations. And what you have to understand in this region is that all of these things that we have here, I don't know, I think they should be of the same category. It is not like these are types of aquifers. When I went on ice ground, I didn't know. These are not actually types of aquifers. They are more like formations themselves, just like aquifers. But since the man gave us like this, then we should take it like that as the aquifers formation. Now, an aquifer is a geologic formation that has sufficient permeable materials, which allows it to take in water and it also pass out the water under normal fit conditions. That means you don't have to force it. Whether the temperature is high or not, water should flow. So the important thing here is that it has sufficient permeability for it to take in water. That means water can flow into it and the water can also flow out. Now, when we start talking about the aquifer, we will see a slight difference between all of them and why they are not really so much considered. Now, aquiferous formations, yeah, I mean, the aquifer contains unconsolidated sand and gravel. That is why they call it a matter that has a sufficient permeability. Because if it has a consolidated particles, then there will be no pore spaces between it. That means that it should not be consolidated, it should not be compacted. Otherwise, water will not be able to flow through it. That is why clay is not really a material that is used or that is considered or that can be named an aquiferous uh, formation. Now, aquifers are also referred to as groundwater reservoirs because they actually take in water. And I told you that once they take in water, the rate at which the water will move out is very slow. Hence, they can actually be tapped at any particular point in time. Now, aquifers have large aerial extents, and this may be overlain or underlain by confining beds of relatively impervious material. Now, these confining beds are the ones that we are going to talk about now. They themselves are like aquifers. They themselves, all of them, they are rocks. But some can take water, some cannot take water. Some can allow water to flow through them, some cannot allow water to flow through them. Now, these are the properties of aquifers that we have just said. Because they are made up of unconsolidated materials. That means they have high, uh, high permeability. Then number two, they act as groundwater reservoirs because they can trap water at any, any point in time. And they also have large area length and they can be bounded by uh, confining bed of relatively impervious materials. That means that the materials of the confining bed should not be as obvious as the aquifer itself, otherwise they themselves should be aquifers. Now the first one is the aquifer. Aquifer is defined as a geologic formation of relatively impermeable material. When you compare it to aquifer, aquifer has permeable material, but this one has impermeable materials, which permits storage of water. That means that it can trap water, but it cannot transmit it. So you can also get water from an aquifer, but then it cannot transmit the water. That's why they do not focus on it. For aquifer, we all pay attention to aquifer because aquifer can actually allow the water to flow from places to places. It supports the movement of groundwater not the one that just traps it there. It is not just a reservoir, it's also a conduit. So for the aquifer, it can take the water, but it does not transmit it in sufficient quantity. And clay is an example of such information. Now, when it comes to aquifer, the aquifer is a rock itself that does not support anything. That means it's just a rock under the ground. It does not take in water and it does not transmit it. So this aquifer, it's more like present mostly as the underground formation or the last bottom rock in any kind of formation. Let's assume we have something like the Venice Lodge, where it's kind. We have something this way. Now, if we have water, I need a little more. If this is where we have water, let's assume this is the isometric surface, and then followed by here we have water in this region. Here we can have water here as well. Now, the bottom where there is no water, the last rock, 
which will be the hardest of them all. This one, they essentially know what I This is what you call the active fuge. If the active fuge were to be here, then it would be impossible to get the water because it is a rock itself. It does not transmit water. In fact, water cannot even get there. That's the fact. So if this were to be an active fuge itself, then there will be no water under here because water cannot pass through an active fuge. It's not possible. So that is the difference between them. For the active fuge, they are more like the last rocks at the bottom because water cannot pass through them. Once water gets to the top of them, the water stays. It doesn't go through. Now, the aquitide is the next. Is the next. Aquitide is a polypermeable one and semi-permeous one, which means that they, they support, they can, they permit storage of water, but then they obstruct groundwater movement and they do not yield water flowing to wells. However, it may transmit appreciable quantity of water to adjacent aquifers. Now, they are sandy clay and all of those things. One thing about the aquifers is that they themselves, they can be, uh, how should I say, they can be intermediate between an aquifer and then an aquifer, which means that the aquifer, this one can be an aquifer, anyone here can be an aquifer, but not on the ground. If this one down here could, if this one had been an aquifer, that means that the water can still flow down again. The water can still go down if this were to be an aquifer. So that is the definition for all of them. So the number one thing you should understand is that aquifer is the one that has water coming into it and then it can also transmit. The aquifer is the one that is more like a confining, uh, a confining strata. It can confine the water because water can go through it. So the aquifer is what would separate a confined aquifer. Let me look for one of the diagrams. Here, in this particular scenario, this one will most likely be an aquifer. And then this one down here, this impermeable one that nothing can go to will be the aquifer. This will be the aquifer because nothing can go to it. This one could be the aquifer because it does not allow the water to go at all. It confines it totally. Then if there were to be anyone here that can still allow water to go, maybe a semi permeable one, then that should be the aquifer. That's just the definition for all of them. Then here where you can tap water and all those things is the aquifer. So I believe that is clear. And then the kind of material that makes up all of them. You know that the aquifuge is one that, not, that doesn't allow any kind of material. That should be the rock. You can just mention any category of rock. That is the granite. And then for the aquifer, you can still allow things to flow. That's for aquifer. Things can still flow in aquifer. That is sandy clay. Then for clay, I mean for aquifer, water doesn't flow. That is the clay. You can measure clay for that if you ask us for the kind of materials that make them up. Now, porosity, specific yield and specific retention. This was are quite easy. Porosity of a rock is defined as the ratio of the volume of pore spaces to the total volume of materials. That's also easy. Ratio of pore spaces to the total volume of materials. Now, porosity is higher when the materials are of the same size. What does that mean? That means that if you have materials of the same size like this, it is more porous than when you have materials that are of different sides. Of different sides, I mean. So this one has more porosity. But if the materials are to be of different sizes, let's assume that there are smaller materials, then those smaller materials can actually fit into this space. Let me change this. If there were smaller materials, they can fit into here, which means that they will also affect the porosity. The porosity is going to reduce if they were uh, smaller materials. So the smaller materials fill in the spaces that you have, and then they reduce the porosity. So when the sizes are not uniform, the porosity is lesser than when the sizes are uniform. And it also depends on the sharpness of the soil particles. So porosity is affected by fineness of materials, 
sharpness of the soil particles and also on their uniform, it should actually be a particle size distribution. Those are three parameters already. Now, specific yield. This is the ratio of the volume of water that can be drained by the cavity due to the two volume. Now, this definition is not really explanatory of this word yield. This yield means that this is the amount of water that could be pumped that's available for pumping. I think I wrote it over here. Yeah, the amount of water that's available for pumping. This is what we call specific yield. Because after this is the amount of water that can be drained out, which means that when you drain out an amount of water, some amount of water are left, which is more like what you call the hygroscopic water or the capillary water. Now, this amount of water that can be drained, drained out, those are the ones that are actually mobile. They are not static. They are not retained there. They are the water that you can move, whether by mechanical means or whether by natural means of gravity. So the specific yield is the amount of water that is available for pumping. Or in the man's definition, this is the ratio of volume of water that can be drained out after saturation, which means that once the ground is saturated with water, this water can move by itself. These are free water electrons, or you can just say it like that, or free moving water that can move by itself. Now, specific retention. This is the amount of water that will remain after saturation against the force of gravity. This is more like the opposite of specific yield. So when specific yield water has been drained out, Whatever is left, what you call the specific retention. That's what it is. And then they said the velocity is equal to specific yield plus specific retention. Now, it's now ever, it may however be noted that fine grain materials yield little water, whereas wild grain materials permit a substantial release of water, hence the later side of particle. What this is talking about is what we have here, which means that when the materials are small, it is difficult for water to go through when it is big. When they are big, it has larger pores because spaces are left in between them. So, aquifuge materials are materials that have large pore spaces or that have large particle sizes. That is the meaning. Now, division of surface water, this one is also quite easy to understand. There you have this diagram. Just draw them in two layers. The first layer is this, then divide them into two. When you divide it into two, first is the zone of saturation. The zone of saturation is the region where the water does not move away, but the water just stops there and then it fills up the space. That's the meaning. So let's assume water is coming from here. The water will keep going down until there's something to stop it. And here, the water, the ground formation here is an impervious rock which is what they wrote down here. So that means down here, you have something like maybe an aquifuge or an aqui, maybe an, uh, what's the name of the last, last one? Aquifuge, I mean. An aquifuge down here, which is an impervious shock. So this water will come to this spot and then fill up this space until it is full. So the water is going to totally cover this region. This is the saturation point for the zone of saturation. Then the other part where you have water and something, water and air, the water does not totally cover the place. There you have the zone of aeration. Zone of aeration is the zone where there is a combination of water and also air. You see, it has four spaces. That's the zone of aeration. Now, that same zone of aeration is divided into three parts the soil water zone. This is the region where the roots of plants can get through. There, they can get water to that place, up to that point. And in between them, or after the, or after the soil water zone, we have what they call the capillary zone. The capillary zone is a zone where, at this point, water is still here because of what they call the principle of capillarity. That means that the four spaces here hold water. Not that the water is covering the place entirely, but there are four spaces that hold water. The water is rising at that point because of the principle of capillarity. And in between these two spaces is what you call the intermediate zone or the bardose zone. So first, Understand that there is a saturation zone and then there is another zone at the top, which is the uh, aeration zone. And then the aeration zone, you have the soil water part and then the part down that goes capillarity principle. And in between them, you have the bado zone. So there are definitions. The soil water zone extends from the ground surface to the major root zone 
that means that's the point where the root of plants can get to. The soil in this zone becomes saturated either by irrigation or by rainfall. That means that there is not expected to be any amount of water in that field at all. Not that there will be no amount of water, there should be no saturation there unless there is rain or during irrigation. Any water that gets there should not stay in that region, rather, it should go down to the saturation zone. And the excess water, which cannot be retained by the soil, is called gravitational water. That means that once water gets to the soil water zone, the water stays at the top for a while and it goes straight down by effect of gravity. So the water going down is what you call the gravitational water. And then the water remains retained at the top. It's going to only stay there for a while because it's going to ever, either be uh, evaporated away or sucked up by the plant roots. Then intermediate zone. Intermediate zone is the zone in between the soil water zone and also the capillarity zone. This zone usually comes, it contains non-moving vados water, which is held by molecular and surface tension forces. I think I need to highlight this. It is held by molecular and surface tension forces in the form of hydroscopic and capillary water. Temporarily, this zone may also contain some excess water, which, however, moves downward as gravitational water. The thickness of this zone may vary from zero to more than 100 meters deep, depending on the water table condition. Now, then the capillarity zone. The capillary zone extends from the water table up to the limit of capillarity. Now, this particular zone, I don't think it has any proper definition. Anywhere there are post cases that can actually suck up water by natural uh, capillarity, that is the point where you can call the capillary zone, which means that as long as the water can rise to the capillarity spaces, then that makes up the capillary zone. And then here we have zone of saturation. The zone of saturation is the, uh, is the zone that is bounded by the limiting surface of saturation called water table. Here you have the water getting to the ground, and then the highest point where the water gets to, compared or bounded by the impermeable surface. That's where you call the saturation point. That means the water fills up all of this space, then the highest point of the water makes up the saturation point. Now, the explanation of this next statement is this. The statement is, if a well penetrates a zone of saturation with a water table forming its upper surface, then the static, well, the static water level in the well stands at the same elevation. What this is saying is this. If you have a well penetrating into this zone of saturation, this is where it comes from the top. Then the, it, uh, it says there are the water table forming the upper surface. Then the static water level in the well stands at the same elevation as the water table. That means the water table, the level of water in the well will only be here at this water table level. When we go down more, you'll see how that is there, depending on where the depth of the well is. Now, the saturation actually extends slightly above the water table due to capillary action. action. Of course, we know that, that whenever you dip a small object or something that has a small space into a larger space where you have an amount of should I say diffusion or water rising due to capillarity. So the water might eventually get up to this point due to the effects of capillarity. That means the various conclusion. Now however when the zone of saturation is bounded at the top by an impermeable stratum then the water is in contact with the bottom of the impermeable stratum. Now, what it is explaining is, if by adventure, let me draw another one. You have the impermeable rock here. And then for maybe by occurrence, there is another impermeable structure here. Let's say semi-permeable. And then you have a well deep into this point. The water level. That means the water level will go beyond here. It will not be at the water table region. 
because this water is already being confined under pressure, so it is going to rise higher than the way it is in that place. So it says that when the zone of saturation is bounded at the top by an impermeable stratum, the water is in contact with the bottom of the impermeable strata and it's under pressure. That's what you should notice. Then there is no water table within that region. That means that the water table is somewhere else, and then you have dipped your well below the confining stratum. Then, when a well penetrates the zone of saturation of this type, of this type, the water will rise above the bottom of the confining strata. It means that the water is going to rise far above this confining strata because it is already under pressure. So that's the explanation to that. Now there are two types of aquifer. We have the confined aquifer and then the unconfined aquifer. Of course, the unconfined aquifer is the one in which the upper surface of the zone of saturation is the water table itself. For example, you have something like this. There you have here you have the impermeable surface, and then the water surface forms the highest point, or let's say the upper surface. The water table forms the upper surface of this zone. That's what you call the unconfined aquifer. So which means that there is no other impermeable structure at the top or impermeable formation at the top. It is just the water table and the impermeable one at the bottom. Why the confined aquifer? For confined aquifer, there will be another formation at the top, bounding it from the one at the bottom. So here, impermeable down here, and then impermeable up here. And then the water table is not present inside here. This is what you call the confined aquifer. That means all of these places is filled with water, and then the water table can be elsewhere. Let's assume that the water table is even elsewhere. So if the water table is present here, then you have the, the confined aquifer inside here. And then for this one, the water table is this itself. This forms the unconfined aquifer. Now, in this diagram, we have a diagram showing the recharge area, the water table, isometric surface. There's the isometric surface. We have the ground surface. We have a flowing well, the artisan well, and then the water table. Now, if you want to draw this diagram, there's something, or there are things that you need to note about this diagram for you to draw it properly. First, you have three wells. One of them is the flowing well. Second is the water table, the water table well, and then the third is the artificial well. Now, we have to understand that two of the wells get to the confined aquifer, while one well gets to the unconfined aquifer. I already told you before that the confined aquifer is one that is bounded by two impermeable layers. Here is one impermeable layer, and then here is another one. So when you dig a well and it gets to this point, definitely the water should rise higher than this point. According to what we saw in the statement earlier, the water will rise higher than this. And the same thing here to rise higher than this. Then for the confined, the unconfined aquifer well, the water will only stop at the water table. That's because the water here is not under any pressure. Or it's not under a pressure higher than the one in the atmosphere. So here, the water stops here. Now for the artisan well, and why is this not flowing? What will determine the point of the point where the water in the world will get to is that the water will get to the stage where the water table decides. The water will get to the stage where the water table decides. Now, the water table from confined aquifer is what our normal water table will be today. But for a confined aquifer, the water table is called the piezometric surface. That's where the water table is. So, in this particular region, the water here. We keep rising until it gets to the piezometric surface. That's the definition for that. So here the water gets to the piezometric surface. But for this flowing well, the flowing well is happening because you have water coming out by itself because it is below the piezometric surface. So since I said it that the water will rise as high as the piezometric surface, then for this place, it is below the piezometric surface. That's why you have the flowing well there. 
So a flowing word will occur when there is a well top that is left back or that is below the piezometric surface of the confined aquifer from where it is starting its source. So for you to draw this, just draw your regions. Let me assume I come here. First, I could draw it this way. I draw my confining strata. This is the confining strata. And I hear the water table can be here. Well, the water table is present there, then you insert your three wells, ensure that one of them is higher than wherever you want to put your piezometric surface. Now, the one that is below the piezometric surface becomes a flowing well because that is where the water is supposed to get to normal use. But then it is below that, so the water gets to spill out. Therefore, the water table well, the water will only rise as high as the water table, and therefore, the artisan well, the water itself will rise as high as the isometric surface, so it does not go beyond the surface of the water. And the reason for that is because the water is under pressure itself. So that's the pressure for all that we have here. And here we have a flowing well is developed when piezometric surface lies above the ground surface. That means the surface or the height of the well is below the piezometric surface. And like I said, that the piezometric surface is the same thing as the water table in an unconfined aquifer. Now, there are other types of aquifers, which is the first aquifer. The pressure aquifer happens when there is a layer of water that is separating, or let's say, a, when a layer of rock is separating the amount of water from the main body of water, that's when we have the pressure aquifer. Here we have an impermeable rock holding this amount of water in this place, separated from the normal water table. That is what you, what you can call the pressure aquifer. And here is also an impermeable strata holding this water in this place. Now, this is also a great source of water, but then the water cannot be recharged. That means once water is exhausted, then it's exhausted. So for you to dig a well, so you have to go beyond this place down to that. But then if you dig your well and then you find water and then you stop there, sometimes the water will just dry out and then there will be no recharge. So it said that these aquifers are not recharged. That's the right. Then leaky and confined or semi-confined aquifer. A leaky aquifer is one in which is bound at the top by semi pervious strata or semi confined layer. The water level in a well penetrating the semi confined aquifer will rise above the bottom of the confining strata and it represents the elevation of the piezometric surface at that point. Further in this case, water is stored in the top semi pervious strata, which forms an unconfined aquifer lying above the semi confined aquifer. The top semi confined strata may be May be, may be designated as an aquitard. Like I said before, that the aquitard is one that permits an amount of water to flow through. But then it can hold water, but water can only a little amount of water can flow through. That's the aquitard. So when the, an aquitard separates an amount of water or acts as a top binary surface for an amount of water, then you have a semi confined aquifer. The totally confined aquifer is when you have two impervious materials confining an amount of water, then you have a confined aquifer. But if this one at top becomes a semi pervious then it becomes a semi-confined aquifer. And that's what you have here. This is the leaky aquifer because it's bounded by the aquifer. If this were to be an aquifield or an aquifuge, then you can call it a totally confined aquifer, not a semi -confined. Now, permeability of stratified soils. Gradually, we are getting to the calculation part. First, is to define what a porous media is. A 
The porous media is one that has grain particles of different sizes that support interconnected pore spaces. That means that it has interconnected pore spaces through which water can flow. That's what we call a porous media. So long as water can flow through it, that means it has interfaces that are connected. That means it can act as a conduit. So that means that. Now, we have the unsaturated one and then the saturated one. The saturated one is one that has water occupying every part of it. That is saturated one. Why the unsaturated one is one that has water and then air in some other part of it. Now, we said it before, the vertical flow of water is the theory of infiltration, and then this is governed by that is law. Our topic is on the permeability of uh, soil. And if you are looking at water flowing through it, then most of the water that comes or that happens on the ground is governed by uh, that is law. And that is where we are taking the vertical flow from. Now, from here, we have that is law to be Ki. This is that is law V equal to Ki. This is B. This is that is law. And then from there, Q is equal to V times A. That's how we have it. Now, I said it before that the I is the hydraulic gradient, and I is changing vertical height over the change in length. Now, this Q is called fluid density. But when we go further, you will find that it could also be called another name which is the specific discharge. Now, the fluid density is more like the Q itself divided by A. That means the flow per unit area, that's the fluid density. The flow per unit area, that's the fluid density. And it is sometimes called specific discharge. Now, mechanics of flow. Here, there are not much things to also note here. They are just familiar things that we could have seen know. First, we have a gross media to be made up of different kind of materials. First, we have the isotropic. Isotropic is the one that has material, a medium that has uniform properties in other direction. The way you would know an isotropic material is if you view it from another direction, the view should be the same. Not I view from another direction and then there's a change in pattern. The pattern should be the same from any direction that you look at it from. Just like looking at a wall. If you bend and look at a wall, you should see the same pattern of concrete. So that the concrete from one side is different from the concrete from another side. So that is isotropic material. It has uniform properties in all directions. Then anisotropic material is one that has more than one property and then they depend on direction. Homogeneous material is one that has uniform properties. But this one, when it comes to homogeneity, we are not talking about the direction at all, we are just talking about the distribution of the properties. While the heterogeneous is one that does not have uniform properties. Now to this, here we are talking about the isometric potential. That is what this diagram is for. And then the isometric potential is the potential difference from the surface of the water to the deep zone. That's that. Now, the way you would measure the isometric potential is relative to any point that you are picking. So the isometric potential in this case would be the uh, the distance from the deep zone to the points you are measuring minus the distance from the points you are measuring to the isometric surface. So that's that. And then from here you have to add the two of them together. So this one is for point A because you are taking an addition of the Z A and then the Z B. So if the point that you're looking at is above the water table, then that means you have to do a subtraction. But if it is below the water table, then you have to do an addition. So in that case, you are looking at the distance between the body itself, the point you are taking from the water table, and then the distance from the point you are taking to the deep zone itself. So it will be distance from the deep zone minus distance from the water table. That is the isometric potential for a point that is higher than the water table. But if the point is lower than the water table, it will be distance from the datum to the point plus distance from the point to the water table. That is the isometric potential. But then the isometric potential basically is the distance from the datum to the top of the water table.
now properly to that is door. We said it before that that is door is V equal to KI, and then when you take consideration of the fact that the flow is area times velocity, then you have KIA. Now, this negative is here because of the fact that we have an I that is equal to H2 minus H1 over L, where H2 is actually at a point that is lower than H1. And that's because the water will flow from a point that is higher to a point that is lower. So here, H2 will be lower than H1. That's why you have a negative. Now, specific discharge, this is what we saw at the top just now as the fluid depth. Yeah, this Q is equal to Q, Q over A, and that's the same thing here. And from here, you would find that according to that law, you have this happening. Now, this is the total head, where you have the pressure is F over A. Here I'm trying to explain how they got this. This is density divided by unit weight. I mean pressure, I mean hydrostatic pressure divided by unit weight, how it relates to pressure head. Now, the pressure itself is forced over area, while unit weight is forced over volume. So by the time you do the dimensional analysis, you have meter length, which means that there, this height is meters, and then here it's also meters. And then this is related to this thing that we have here, where you have the pressure and then the height here. Now, when you put this into this formula for H, this Q is equal to, I want to again, here, let me write it here. Q is equal to K I. I. Now this I is equal to the H over the X. Now we said that our, our H is this. That's why they substituted it H into this. So you have Q equal to a negative K times our I, which is the H, and our H is Z. pressure over unit weight then dx. That's how this came about. Now, as for this, I tried this. I don't know how they got this. So if anyone has an explanation to that, you can explain that at any time. Now, limitations. In a non-saturated flow, we already said it before that the Reynolds number should be less than one for that this flow to be applied. That means it should be for laminar flows. But that is law. Deviation from that is law, of course, when the Reynolds number is as low as two. However, it may not depart to respect to 10. That means that this 10 is the limit for application of that is law. Reynolds number should not be greater than 10. Should not be greater than 10 for that is law to be applied. And then the formula for Reynolds number. This is rho VG over uh, the viscosity. Now, you would understand that in the formula that we know, this ought to be V. But from what we have seen, V is equal to Q over A. And it is also equal to the fluid density, which is also Q over A. And that is Q equal to small Q. So that means that this fluid density is same thing as this. When it comes to this flow, and that's why they substituted the Q for V in this regard. Now, permeability. Now, permeability is the measure of the rate at which fluid will pass through a porous medium. So permeability is a measure of rate, and then the rate at which we pass through a porous medium. Porosity that we saw before is the 
amount of four spaces that you have relative to the total volume of spaces that you have. But then, when it comes to permeability, you're talking about the rate at which something can move through those four spaces. And we have two types of permeability. We have the one related to the medium, and then the one related to the fluid. Now, the one related to the medium is what they call the specific or intrinsic permeability. And that is gotten by the agent's formula. Specific or intrinsic permeability. That's the one that they call that. But then the, the permeability that we have in this formula for that is only talking about the fluid, not about the medium. So the ductive permeability is talking about the fluid. Now, how do we measure permeability? Permeability when it comes to fluid condition, this is the formula that we use. It says that the, uh, the, the constant the question of permeability multiplied by the viscosity at fluid condition should be equal to coefficient of permeability at standard condition multiplied by the coefficient uh, the viscosity at standard condition. That is something that was written here, but I just simplified my own. So the multiplication of coefficient of permeability and the viscosity should be constant for the field and the standard condition. Now for the standard condition, this viscosity is measured at two temperatures, either at 60 Fahrenheit or 15 degrees Fahrenheit. So whichever is given to you, that is what you are going to use. Now, based on the question that the man gave us a class, here's the question he gave us a class. He said that a laboratory test is done on an aqua car, and it shows that the standard coefficient of permeability is this. I told you that the standard will be measuring will be measured at a temperature of either 60 or 15. So that means this one is for this standard temperature. Now, we said that we should calculate the field coefficient of permeability. And the field coefficient of permeability was measured at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So that means that we have to go and get the uh, viscosity at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So first write the formula. The formula is K for the field multiplied by the viscosity for fluid should be equal to K for the standard multiplied by viscosity for standard. So our K for field Calculate the coefficient of permeability for okay. We are looking for k for fluid, that means we are looking for k multiplied by the viscosity at fluid temperature. It was measured at 50 degrees of fluid, so that means we are taking this. Then should be equal to. The standard one, standard uh, coefficient, which is this. Multiply by the viscosity at standard temperature, which is this. So by the time you do that, then you know what to define. So if this doesn't stay, just understand it like this, that if you have the standard uh, coefficient of uh, permeability multiplied by viscosity should be equal to the field parameter. So that's all. And then the standard could be given at either 15 degrees Fahrenheit or 50 degrees Fahrenheit, any of them. Now to this transmissivity. Transmissivity is equal to uh, hydraulic conductivity multiplied by the depth of the aquifer. When we go further, we will see more about this. Now, factors that affect permeability. Now, these ones are things that we can easily remember because we have, from the formulas of permeability that we have had, things that have been coming up. Density has been coming up and viscosity uh, has been coming up. So it's easy for us to uh, 
for us to remember that. Just mention this at the school because from all of the things that we have been saying, under permeability, we've seen viscosity, and also viscosity is also related to density. Density is the amount of uh, amount of particles that you have per unit body. Why viscosity is the response of a fluid to changes in its position, or the uh, response of a fluid to movement, or the ability of a fluid to have movement through itself. That's the viscosity, and they both depend on each other and they are affected by temperature. So if you want to be smart, you can mention that temperature affects permeability, density affects the temperature, and the viscosity affects it. And then flow turbulence. The effect of this I really couldn't visualize it, but I guess if you uh that the that relates to the uh, to the laminar flow or turbulence which is affected by the Reynolds number. And then soil porosity, of course. What have I been doing? Soil porosity have also been part of the N value, and then shape and arrangement of particles. We know that this one should have soil affect. So we have about five things that we know that are always standard in affecting the parameters that we have in this place. First is the density, the viscosity, the temperature, the soil porosity, and then the shape of the particles. And then we also have the degree of saturation. And then the thickness of the absorbed layer in case of the fine grain soil. Now for the agent's approximation, this is the question that the man gave us in class, sorry, in the test. And that is the same thing that we have for the specific permeability specific and intrinsic permeability. And it is saying that the permeability is equal to coefficient varying between this, we didn't tell us what the coefficient actually means, multiplied by, by the effective size of the particles. It does not make allowance for a change in velocity or shape of the particles. That means whatever the shape of the particles are, this thing doesn't really consider it. Whether they are uh, sharp, Shapes or the rounded in shape or the actual shape is just considered. It doesn't consider, and that is actually supposed to consider it. Because when we're considering the factors that affect it, we look at the shape, and even factors that affect ground recharge. We are talking about the subsurface particles. So there, we have things that are supposed to affect it, but this particular exists approximation does not put those things into consideration. And that's the limitation of our system. Now. To the very serious part, <laughs> which is the permeability of stratified soils. Now, permeability of stratified soil, this one is quite technical, but then if you also understand the concepts behind it, I guess it's easy for you to, uh, for you to. Put everything down into right now. We have the horizontal flow and then the vertical flow. The horizontal flow is first. What you have to understand first is the end formula. If you can picture the end formula, then it will be easy for you to know where you are going. So, this is the end formula. You have the length multiplied by the coefficient of permeability, which is different from the both of them, and then uh, divided by the sum of all of the lengths. Why for the vertical, you have this. And here, this should be separated by this, which means that they are divided by each other. Now, let us see how to derive that. First thing is to understand the diagram itself, that you have an amount of water flowing through this. Now, each of the layers, it is flowing through them horizontally. That means this will spring through, through this area separately. The flowing through this area separately. And we know that the amount of water flowing through this area will definitely be more than that flowing through this area. So that means their areas are different. Their cues are also different, not the same cue passing through them. And I think from even from principle of current, uh, the movement of current, that the current will flow through the parts with lesser resistance more than the part that is of higher resistance. The same thing here. The area here is actually lesser than Q, so you should have more. The Q2 should be higher than Q1. Now, the length is also different. But one thing that is the same thing here is the I, because they are tilted in the same way. You don't have the H2 iron and the H1 in any form. So, in this regard, you have I to be the same. Now, the parameters I should always remember whenever you are trying to derive this, they are talking about five parameters the Q, 
the L, the A, and then the K and the I. And one important thing is that for the horizontal flow, the Q is the governing equation. Where you have it that the total Q coming is equal to the sum of the Qs that are actually split into the layers. So here you have the total Q to be equal to Q1 and then Q2. While you have I1, I is also the same thing because it is tilted in, so they're on top of each other, so there's no issue. But then the areas are different. So first, define these particles. Q is equal to Q1 plus Q2. L is equal to L1, L2. They are different. They are not equal to each other. A is the sum of the two areas. They are also different. They are not equal to each other. And then K should as well be different. So you know that K is different. So you should have K. K1 should be separate. And then K2 should as well be separate. And then I, the I at the center. So we define all of the five parameters. Now, we have Q equal to KIA. What we want to define basically is the K. So we are going to first identify where the Qs are. So Q, Q, K is equal to Q over I and A. Now the Qs, this is the Q for number one. It's supposed to highlight this. Okay. For layer one, this is Q because Q is equal to KIA. So K for layer one, multiplied by the I, we say that the I is at the same thing and then A for layer one. And then for layer two, we have the K2, I, and then A2. While for the overall I and A, this is A and I. So Q is equal, K is equal to Q, this is Q, over I, A, and that is it. Now, if you factorize out the parameters that are the same, the I, and the same that the I is for, so the bring out I for all of you. I is the same to and then I is the same here. So we bring out the I, the I can cancel each other. Now, we want to also find out something that is the same thing. We express the area at length times width, or length times width. So K is equal to Q I A. We already have that I is gone. So K times area, which is what we have here. The area here is the length times width that we have here. So the breadth is the same thing for this. This is the breadth in which we have. Or maybe you can even take this. Let's take this as the breadth. They are the same thing. So the breadth cancel each other. And then you have K1, L1, K2, L2, which is the final formula. Just understand that what you want to get basically <clears throat> is Q. Is equal to Q1 plus Q2. And then the Ks are different. So K is equal to Q over I and A. The first Q has its own parameter separately, which is K1 times I1 times A1. And then K2 times A2 times I2. And then you have this formula K. So that is how to derive that. Then for this one, this one is a little more stable. First thing again, derive all of them, write out all of the parameters. I have five, five parameters to write out the discharge, the length of the layers, the area, the coefficient of permeability, and then the, uh, the gradient. Now, the flow in this regard, you are coming from up. So the amount of flow Q that goes through layer one, it is not splitting, it goes through layer two exactly the same way. So the amount of Q that flows through here will eventually penetrate and flow through this one. That is why we said that the Qs are the same thing. Q1 equal to Q2 equal to the normal Q. Then the area also, in the area through which the Q is flowing is also the same thing. So you have A1 and then A2 being the same thing. Why the L are different? The K is also different. We know that the, for the both categories, K is at the same. And then for I. Now, I in this regard is different because the water is not flowing on the parallel lines any longer, but rather it's flowing vertically. So if one side is, if you tilt it, you have one side in higher than the other one. So you have the gradient difference in the region. Now, Q equal to KIA, estimate your K as well. Here also, we started from K. So your K is equal to Q over IA. 
the same thing here to q over i a but now our i is different because we don't have a single i any longer here we eliminated the i here the i was eliminated but here you do not eliminate the i put your i inside which is the i1 plus the i2 now we take our i out to be one over i and then we understand that our i is equal to change in height over change in length so for number one i is changing horizontal height so vertical height over change in length and then here too for the i2 we have change in height over change in length that is how we have this here so q over a multiplied by multiplied by the i that we have here and now if you turn this upside down and then find the lcm and all those stuff this is what you are going to have but i is equal to q over ka so this same i again put your q over k into it because in the formula that we have there is no i just k and n and that is present in the formula that we have so we have to look for a way to eliminate this q eliminate the a and eliminate the i so for that to happen you can just make your i to be equal to q over a, k a. Now, there is no way we can make q over k a, I mean q and a, to have an i in there because their eyes are different. And even the eyes are the same, we would have reached for a way to make this one to be equal to k i a and then cancel out the i and then the a on this. But because the eyes are different, express this one as its own k i a separately. So q over k a separately. And then this one also Q over K is here. That's what I have here. And because the Qs are the same from the diagram, you have Q canceling Q here. You know, you have to factorize out. So Q over K cancels Q over K A. And then what you have left is L1 over L2. L1 plus L2 over L1 over K1 plus L2 over K2. So that's how to derive those formulas that we have. So this one is for number one. The first, well, which is the horizontal flow. And then here is for the vertical flow. So that is all about the first slide. Now, the important thing that I feel like the man might ask us definitely is when you ask us about the definition for ground based ideology. And that's what I just talked about that you have to describe ideology first. If you are listening to this at any time, just understand that if you understand ideology by its own self, you can describe ideology, then describe groundwater. Ideology is a science that this will be occurrence. You have to talk about this, talk about the distribution, talk about the movement, and then talk about the storage, if possible. Occurrence of water. Then link it to the groundwater, the water that has infiltrated into the ground, and of course, below the water table and in geologic formation. So that's that about that. And then to draw this, I say you have to draw four circles. That is the four layers. According to what I want here, there are four layers and then eight parameters. So for you to draw this, you have to remember that you have four areas and then eight P's. It will help you to remember properly in case anything is moving. So the parameters you have is evapotranspiration, the precipitation, effective precipitation, infiltration, and then effective infiltration. And also you have the surface or no, surface discharge, and then surface or no, and then the groundwater discharge. And then the layers. The layer down here is the aquifer. That is where the water is eventually stored. You have the physiometric surface, which is the surface, the water table in relation to confined aquifers. And then you have the ground surface. Here is where you have the uh, the ground formation, the topography, and then the uh, vegetation, and then the atmosphere, the movement of, the, of water in the atmosphere. I mean, where the water gets to the point it's supposed to. So we also have the geomorphology. We say that geomorphology is more like the topography, that is the ground surface formation. These are things that affect how water replenishes into the ground. The surface of the water is number one. At the surface of the ground, that is topography, that's what we call the geomorphology. And then also surface of soil. Apart from the makeup of the surface, you have the components of the soil surface itself. These things affect the way water gets into the ground. Then you are talking about the vegetation cover and then the humidity, the issue with humidity. They're followed by the subsurface geology that is under the ground. The third here, you're talking about the composition of the soil. That is what the soil is made of. 
I mean, what is subsoil is full of amine, then get the piezometric surface. Like I explained before, that if the piezometric surface is closer to the surface of the ground, then you have a faster replenishment rate. And if it is far, then you have a slower replenishment rate. Then, uh, management of water resources. Today, you are talking about the uh, activities of man to control the ground replenishment, such as dam, irrigation, flooding, urbanization, and the stuff like that. And we also described this that the pressure spring is when you have the water table meeting the ground surface. That's when you have the pressure spring. What if we have the yeah, the ground when uh, the ground submerged somehow and then the water table meets it. So here you have water coming out. That's the depression spring. And then here you have the contact spring. Contact spring is when you have the water table just meeting. The ground surface casually because you have an impervious layer supporting the pervious layer. Yes, yes, the pervious layer. And if a layer is pervious, then definitely you should contain water. So the water could not go into the ground, but rather it retained up here. And then there was a part of the slope that met the surface of the ground where the water table went. And then for this one, the factor is that you have two layers of impervious rock confining a pervious layer. And then something happened, and then there was a crack in one of the impervious layers, and water begins to flow naturally out of the plasma. And then the final one is the impervious rock stream. Probably this two are the same thing I can't really say. So, uh, what makes me want to? Now, most of the we talk about that. Too. Definition of aquifer. Yes, we said the aquifer is one that. Is having a very impermeable material. They have impermeable material. That means they can store water, but then they can't allow the water to get that's full of clay. Then the aquifer is the one that is so strong that nothing passes through it. It doesn't retain water and then it doesn't transmit water. And that is the rock type. So you can measure granite for that. And then for the aquifer, it has semi permeable materials. That's what you have to have the so the aquifer is what forms the leaking or the or the leaking that is the very permeable aquifer. The porosity, the second is the uh, is the ratio of volume of interstices to the total volume of what of the material or the soil that you're considering. Then specific yield is the amount of water available for pumping or the amount of water that uh, that drains by gravity after saturation. Then after the drainage, or after the drain, whatever is kept, so we call the specific retention. And then they are united by this formula. Like porosity is equal to specific retention multiplied by the, so specific retention plus the specific, uh, the, uh, specific yield. Yes. Then you have the subsurface water division. Then you divide into two surfaces, the zone of saturation, zone of aeration. Zone of saturation, you have the soil, the soil water zone where the roots can get to. Then the capillarity water where you have the capillarity effect. Then in between them, you have the intermediate zone. Any well that is dug up to this point will stop at the water table. has the highest way to get to it. Or maybe for capillarity, they get to rise above it casually. But if this were to be a confined aquifer, totally, the water can even penetrate the more even out. I mean, if this were to be a confined aquifer, then the water will rise higher than the bottom of the confining strata or strata. Yeah, I also explained this that flowing well is formed when you have the piezometric surface higher than the top of the well or higher than the ground surface. Artisan well is the one in which the piezometric surface hangs somewhere within the well. And then the water table is the, the water table well is the well that stops in the water table. And then the water table determines the height of water in the well itself. The other types of well, artisan well and flowing well, are the ones that are founded deep into the confined aquifer. Yeah, I also describe the fire aquifer. The fire aquifer is formed when you have a layer of if I maybe material separating an amount of water from the main body of water. So that's that. 
and then porous materials and porous material. That is for now. Let us go to material number two. In five minutes, we will continue with material number two. The time now is five zero three. So by five zero three, I'll continue with material number two. That is material for maybe three to five. So modify this again. Hello?
Okay, I'll continue now. <coughs> so for this one, it says that we are considering that is law and fundamental equations governing the local movement. And then consideration shall be given equally to evaluation of storage coefficients, transmissivity, through pumping data, pumping tests and data and analysis. Then well through equations in various types of Africa. So first, we are talking about steady unidirectional flow. Steady flow is a flow that, or a, a flow in which no change occurs with time. Now, when it comes to confined aquifer, steady flow is possible in confined aquifer because the flow is actually within more like a pipe, not an open flow. And since it is in a pipe, that means the, the, the boundaries of the flow is actually defined and it's steady. Now, the general, the general partial differential equation for unsteady flow is this. And then from this, we can derive our equation for steady flow. Now, this is the general partial equation for partial differential equation for unsteady flow. Now, the reason they call it on steady flow is because this guy can change this dh over the t. That means there's a change in time. The definition for, for, steady, for a steady flow is one with which there's no change in time. But here there's a change in time. So if we can equate this change in time to zero, then this thing becomes a steady flow. So so long as this guy is not zero, then this is on steady. So now they have to make it to be zero. And since now it is zero, then this equation becomes a steady flow. So the difference between these two, two equations is that one is unsteady and then the other is steady. The one that is steady is one where there's the there's no change in time. Now the equation is this. You have the coefficient of permeability in the x direction with the duration of flow in the x direction, then the y direction. And then the Z Okay, so then we have the x parameters and then the y direction and then the z direction. This one is in very different dimensions. And then now we have made it to be a steady flow. Now, the fact that we have the properties of the medium changing or properties of the medium in different directions, then it means that it is not isotropic. It is anisotropic. So these guys are different. So that means the property in the x direction is not the same thing as the property in the y direction, and it's not the same thing as the property in the x direction. So if we should equate them, then this thing should become isotropic. And one of the assumptions that we're going to make for this thing is that it is an isotropic medium. So then when you equate all of them, it becomes isotropic. And then you can factorize out, you can factorize your k out. And the way you factorize your k, the Bible said by k, or use this, uh, this principle of products. So that means this guy is equal to zero, or k equal to zero. So that is how we uh, brought it down to this. We reduce it to the k is gone. That means it's taken as isotropic. Now, this thing is called the Laplace equation for potential flow. But this flow is still in three different dimensions. So for us to take it to the x direction only, we will have to assume that these guys are absent. So this one is taken as the one for x direction only, and that's what we are going to consider. Now, for a confined aquifer and an unconfined aquifer, the confined aquifer is what you have here. And in this regard, the water table is not within this region for the confined aquifer, which means that the water is touching here. 
and the water is also touching down. It's touching the top and the bottom. So here there is no three layer of water. That means something like this is not here. So the water has a uniform head and then a uniform bottom here. But for the unconfined aquifer, the water head, the top surface of the water is also one of the flow lines. So that means that this guy can change. It can become like this, or it can even become like this. Anyway, this thing varies. So this is for the unconfined aquifer. And because the two para the two conditions vary, that means the properties of flow in the two of them will not be the same thing. And that's what they are describing here. That students should also know that there are different flow conditions for the confined and the unconfined aquifer. So now let us take the confined aquifer first. The confined aquifer is of uniform thickness, and then the groundwater is with velocity V in the direction of X, in the X direction. Now, for steady flow condition, for X direction, we already said that this thing should be equal to zero. In the X direction, that means it is taken in one direction only. Now, if you integrate this, you have this. And then if you integrate for that, then you have this. Where H is the head above a given vector. Now, the limiting conditions. When X, when H is zero, this is zero. And then if you consider this, this law, that this is said V equal to KI, where I is negative GH over the X, this is how you find the pH over the rate that we are referring to in this case. So then, if you integrate this, that means you first multiply first, you have KDH equal to VDX. After integrating, this is what you are going to have after doing the integration. That is to integrate both sides that we have before. Then this is what you are going to have. So this thing alone describes the flow for a confined aquifer. That was quite easy. But then when it gets to unconfined aquifer, then it becomes a little ambiguous. So now for the unconfined aquifer, we have to note that we said application on a plus equation, I mean this equation that we had here, is not possible for different reasons. Number one, they said water table in this place is two dimensional and it represents a flow line. That means this water table, uh, the surface of water will be something like this. So that means the surface is like this and also like this. And that surface itself represents a flow line, which means that this thing can be like this or like this. The direction can change anytime. Itself is part of the flow line. But here, there is no flow line that is the boundary condition for the confined. That's why the confined was that easy. But here, the unconfined is not easy because the water table is also part of the flow line. So that is number one. The water table has two dimensions and it's a flow line. Then number two, the shape of the water table determines the flow distribution. And then when you reverse this same condition, this same reason for number two, you get the reason for number three. The flow distribution governs the water table. It's more like they are governing each other. The water table determines the flow distribution, and then the flow distribution governs the water table shape. Now, for a solution to be possible, do we need some assumptions? I guess you should ask us this question in exam. Now, they said the velocity of flow is proportional to the tangent of the hydraulic region. So I don't really understand what effect it will have, but I guess the effect is to take a specific straight direction for the flow of water. Instead of having the water table top moving anyhow, it just takes a particular direction of flow. The velocity of flow is proportional to the tangent of the hydraulic region. So number two, the flow is horizontal and then uniform everywhere in the vertical section. That means the flow is horizontal like this and uniform everywhere in the vertical section. So these assumptions will have a limitation and the limitation is that we limit the application of the results of this particular thing. So now since the uh, Laplace equation cannot work, then what equation are we going to use? We are going to use the Gatlin's equation. Because this, uh, these particular assumptions are actually related to Gatlin's assumption. 
So I'm going to use that, that, that fifth equation, which is Q equals to KIA. Q equal to K I A. But then, if you now take this charge per unit width, it will now be this that I wrote here. This is the A. A is length times width or breadth times width. This is the A. Then per unit width, width also with it, you have K H D H D X. And that is what you have here. Remember that the negative is there because Point number two for the age should be higher than point, it will be lesser than point number one, it will be at a lower level than point number one. And this is hydraulic conductivity for the fluid. Now, if you cross multiply here too, that means you will have QDX, QDX, then KHDH, that's what we have here. If you multiply here and then you integrate, you have QX equal to. K H squared plus C. Now, if you apply this boundary condition, that means that when X is zero, H not H is H not, I'm putting here, you get C. Your C will be equal to let's assume here is zero. Then this is H not. Your C will be equal to K H not over C, then it's positive. K H not over two. This is equal to K. H naught square over two. So by the time you put this K H naught square over two into into this formula, put C here. This value of C put it back here. Then you have the equation become this. So now this indicates that the water table is parabolic. Now, for flow between two fixed bodies of water of constant head H0 and H1, the water table slope at the upstream of the aquifer will be this. Now, this thing is simply as equation number five, which is what we have here. This flow per unit width. Now, one thing you should note here is that this equation number seven, this one that we have here, is applied when there is a change in the head. That means you have something like this. This is H2, H1. When you have this, then you apply this equation number two, and number seven, I mean. But when there is no change in the head, like what they said, that you have a constant head, that is equation number five. That is the discharge per unit width that we have. Uh, there are some notes that remind gave us. He said that due to assumption becomes a poor approximation due to the actual flow. To the actual flow, that's because a, the actual flow will not be perfectly horizontal, but due to assumes them to be perfectly horizontal. That means that to an extent, due to its formula or due to expression, will not accurately. Express or may not accurately represent what we have in the field condition. The water, uh, the water table approaches the boundary time generally above the water. Well, these are things that we have said that the water table itself behaves as a the water table surface behaves as a flow line. Now, this flow, he said this flow is, is not in our flow, so we can just skip this. And then move to send the ADR flow in the way. And this is the time. For steady the ADR flow in the way, first, the first definition is go down. And this is the lowering of water table of hydrometric surface of an aquifer due to the pumpage of the well. When you have an aquifer, this is an aquifer, this is where the water was poured. So by the time you start drawing out the water, 
water from the surrounding will also be going down because they are coming into this to an extent. So you are pulling the water from the surrounding, that is why this is coming here. So this difference from the initial water level to the present water location is what you call it water down. So in your own words, you can describe it anyhow and also draw a diagram. Just draw something like a box and then put a well inside and then the initial water level, the present water level, and then draw a curve. Then the drawdown curve. The drawdown curve is the curve that shows the duration of the drawdown with distance. And that is this. This is what they call the drawdown curve. It shows the duration of drawdown with distance. Then cone of depression. This particular shape here is what they call the cone of depression. This is described by the drawdown curve. The outer limit of the cone of depression defines the area of influence of the well. Now let us go to compiler paper. Now the condition here is that in order to derive the radial flow, the radial flow equation with, uh, relating the well discharge to drawdown, the well must completely penetrate the aquifer. What they mean is that this thing that you have you must get the base of the aquifer. You don't suspend it just halfway. So if you are drawing your diagram slope that so that it must get to the base of the aquifer. Other assumptions is that number one, the flow must be two dimensional. Then the well must be homogeneous and isotropic. And then the flow everywhere is horizontal. So that means there is no flow going up this way. And none of them is flat. So they are all horizontal flows. Now, things that you have to note, I think when you get to popular, you will realize this. Now, when it comes to flow in a well, you have to use the formula for discharge. And then there's something here that we should note. Formula for discharge is area times velocity. And then we know that velocity is ki according to this guy. Velocity is ki according to class A. Here is k and then here is i, and then negative follows it. But this 2 pi rb is the area. How did they get that? First, imagine a well this way. If you have a well like this, we know that the circumference here is 2 pi r. And then here is the b. Now, if you cut this part straight like this, and then you spread it out, you will have something like this. This is what you are going to have. And then this circumference is still the same 2 pi r. So here you have 2 pi r. The next is 3 to pi r, only that it is not joining the end of the And then here is b. So the area in this regard is length times b, which is 2 pi r. That is b. That's how they got this 2 pi r b. Now, for a steady radial flow to a well, boundary conditions are this. H is equal to HW, R is equal, is equal to RW. What they are saying is this. You need to note that the R naught is from the center of the well to the extreme, and then H naught is also the extreme. That means this is where the water started from. This is the initial height of water, and this is the initial radius of this well, I guess. And then, the radius of the well is RW, and then the height of the point that I consider here is H, and then the radius to the point is R as well. So R naught is bigger than all other Rs, and then H naught is bigger than all other H. I think that is something that confuses some of the things. Now, this formula that we have here, if you integrate this, let's say here's the key, if you integrate this, because multiply by this. Maybe to give you something like let's see, I can go here. QDR 
there's an R here, so the R goes on like a one over R. Q over R, the R is equal to, we have minus 2 pi KB DH. By the time you integrate this, you have uh, H2 minus H1 or H naught minus H for this, this one becomes H naught minus H and then here you have mean R over R. Here should be R naught because R naught is the initial. Then R W or R anyone. And that's exactly what we have here. Now, there's something you need to note here that this thing here, although the man, I don't know if the man ever told us, but it came out in the text. This thing here is called the length of strain, and it's called S. So this H minus H naught is the length of strain, and it is called S. So this formula here becomes Q equal to 2 pi K S over the R naught over R W. So this is the short form, it is the single word, and that's what we have here. Just that it is a single word in this case. I don't know why the man is this. So that's that for the confined aquifer of a limited extent. The limited extent. I mean, the radius of influence gets to the end of the aquifer that I'm talking about. The confined aquifer. But now, if the confined aquifer is not of a limited economic, it is extensive, extensive confined aquifer, then you might need some other uh, some other test words for you to do whatever you want to do. So in that case, they use B. The simpler one is B. I'll go back to it. Now, it is to be noted that H increases indefinitely with increasing R, but note that H is maximum for the initial uniform. H is the initial uniform head, H naught. Now, equation 16 is called equilibrium or TM equation. Now, I guess they call this equilibrium equation because it should be the same thing for each of the wells. That means that equation can be applied to this well related to this well, and also this well related to this well. And that's what they did in one of the examples that the man put to us. I think there's something about the people. I forgot what the people are doing. Now, it must be surprising to know that the steady radial flow in an extensive aquifer does not exist. So, why? The corner of the air of the motion must exist indefinitely with time. Well, I guess that's easy for us to remember. The things that are not possible is that number one, Jackie's law, is it that the steady flow equation cannot be applied to uh, unconfined aquifers. And that is because the top, the top layer, that is the water table behaves as a flow line itself, and also because the flow is in multiple dimensions. But then, if we give us some assumptions, now it's also said that it is not possible in real life. But in this case, for this, it says that steady radial flow in an extensive aquifer does not exist from the theoretical point of view because the cone of the pressure must extend indefinitely with time. Now, practically, however, each approaches each one with distance from the world. All of the things that we can actually read now, note, theoretically, it is said that, so that the I just read, TM equilibrium equation has, um, allows for the estimation of an hydraulic property and transmissivity of this anomaly. Methodology, how do we apply that? It consists of measuring a drawdown in two observation wells at different distances from a pumped well at constant rate. At constant, that means that we have to equate their rate. A single chest well is possible, but it is not usually encouraged because of the possible 
because of errors due to well losses. Our transmissivity we saw it in the other place where it was KH. Here it was KB, or here it is KB. Where K is the coefficient of permeability and then B is the thickness of the aquifer. So this is what we have here. Now, for you to get the formula for transmissivity, you have to get K from this formula, or better still, make K be the subject of formula. By first multiplying this one comes here. That's why you have Q times this. So it's divided by Q pi into all of this. This is what we call the transmissivity. Now, using two observation words, you have H2 and H1 in R and R1. Instead of H0 and H, there's R0 and R1. And that was exactly the change that happened. So there's really nothing special from here. Now, the derivations. Okay, one thing that they mentioned here is that for you to apply this formula in real applications, you have to take the readings for a whole long time for you to have an appreciable steady state condition and a uniform rate. I mean, for you to have an appreciable a, an appreciable and steady drawdown, you have to do it for a long time and then your wells must be closed. Your observation wells must be closed to your major well. So let's assume you have this. If this is your major well, then your observation well should be closed. They should not be too far away because you want to have a significant measure of this. Because if they get far away, this thing will eventually normalize at a particular point and it will start moving normally. So if you take your observation wells to be far away, then you might have them to look, they will have almost the same pattern of the drawdown form. So they should be close to this for you to have something tangibly different. And then they say you should do it for a long time for you to establish a uniform state. A uniform and a steady state condition. Now, the derivation assumes the following because these are normal assumptions that we normally do homogeneous and isotropic uniform thickness, infinite areal extent. That is for this. For you to have two observation words, infinite areal extent. If it is not something of an infinite areal extent, then our 2 pi ds, or what is it? 2 pi kds. Where this thing is the S, so that this should just be applicable. But for you to apply this formula where you have two observation wells here. So this is here. For you to have the one where you have two observation wells, it should be of infinite serial extent. And then, of course, this is one of the assumptions that we saw at the beginning. The well should penetrate the entire aquifer. And then the parametric level is initially horizontal. What that means. This parametric level is initially horizontal. What it means is that they had a uniform beginning. This was where the water was before. So there's a uniform reference point from here to here before they started doing the drop down. Now for unconfined aquifer. And what did you see? Yeah, for all confined aquifers, I'm still doing the one again. Using the point assumption, this is the same thing. The same formula that we have for this far. Using KIA. This is the area multiplied by the hydrolytic. hydrologic hydraulic gradient, which is from that. So we have the K, this is the K, multiplied by the high, multiplied by the H. The H in this regard is 2 pi R H. Now, when you integrate, this is what we have after the integration. And then, using the gravitational wells, the form is the Yeah, this one is just for a single well. That's why you have H not in the initial height of water, and then height of water in the well that we're looking for. The initial radius of water and then the radius of the world that you are looking for. And here is when you have two observation worlds. Then for the transmissivity in this regard, transmissivity is KB. But in the other formula, we had a B present to the formula, 
but here there is no belief, there is an edge. So you have to make it, you have to make your kid is supposed to come in after to multiply with your belief to get the chance to give up the master's work to happen. But yeah, the beat then is taking an eight one to each of you over two. So then the example I was given to us. So now both one to that is out. I tried drawing the diagram for us. We could say that the following observations were made on the 300 millimeter diameter well penetrating and also final paper. The rate of pumping is this. And then you have two test wells. Then the depth of water was there. So the initial depth of water was this. Then the depth of water was initially given from an horizontal. So we have to drop down. And if that is the drop down, the drop down is 0 0.6. That means the height of water present in it will be this, which is 50 minus 0 0.6 to the depth of water is 4. And then 60 minus 4, minus 0 0.6 to the depth of water is 0.6 plus 0 0.2. And then the radius from the test wells are at the same So first, so this was supposed to be log E in E, but then it was converted to log 10, and then the 2 pi H was used here, you get 1.76. That's how they get that. Then they equated the rate for first well to second well. I think it was stated in one of the assumptions that the observations were made at constant rate here. Was made as constant rate, so that means the rate for both equations were equated. So for test well number one, you had R for the major well, that is the so the H, which is the initial height of water minus the height of water in the next in the well that you are contributing, the radius of equivalence is the R, the radius of the well is one to the then equated to the next well, and after solving the rate of R to the base, and after getting the R to the base, you can then get. Your flow back. So this, our flow was already given to us in the 1000 hours, so we expect it at this. And then you can calculate your K. From there, we get our R. Then you substitute your R back into the formula with your Q to get your coefficient. did in this case is that they said a two well of 30 centimeter diameter that is the radius of the well the concentration penetrates a fully confined aquifer. The length of the strainer is 25 meters that is the H2 or H naught minus H that is this. Calculate the yield from the well let me calculate the Q under a drawdown of this that is the length of strainer is this. And then go down to the one call because if the coefficient of permeability is permeability of the aquifer is 50 meters per day, assume radius of influence is this. So everything there becomes J. So 2 pi KBS divided by all of this. Then more questions are there. But this. I have studied this. I don't know why this happened to be like this, but this is the only question that had this kind of formula expression. Other formulas maintain the same pattern, which is the confined aquifer 2 pi KPS. The same thing 2 pi KPS for the next question. Here to 2 pi KPS. And then here, this is our normal formula that we know. For two observation words. Question A. Is 
design and open world, for it to be binary, yeah. The dimension I should design, I'm saying, looking for the radius of the world. And then the same 2 pi KBS. So 2 pi KBS is the general one that you consider whenever you are looking at a well that is a single well, while you have to take the h2 square minus h1 square which is in one for five that paper using two observational wells. So just h minus h not minus h or h2 minus h minus h minus h minus h minus h minus h minus so that is all. Thank you very much. I'll go through all of this and then I'll send the notes properly. And if you want my own material where I highlighted most of the things that I've explained, probably you can tell me so I can go to the future. So thank you very much, Michael. I think we're almost at our next person that I can see online. So go. I'll go to the next person. Thank you. Yeah, I did one.